This evening we're going to be talking about an introduction to data science on the Azure platform. As we go along, if you've got any questions, please yell out. Uh, we've got someone with a microphone nearby, so um, when you do have a question, please just raise your hand. The reason we do that is to uh, capture it on our live stream, which we're going out to. So this is me, my name is Nick Weinhold. I'm a, a solution architect here at SSW. I was a um, MVP for about seven years, wrote a number of books on C Sharp and .NET performance, spent a lot of time outdoors and with my kids, two kids up the back there, Alex and Jess, 13 and 10. Um, I enjoy DevOps, machine learning and large scale development. I spent about a decade in and around CBA working on uh, largely Comsec, but also NetBank and a few of their platforms there. So I've got a lot of sort of experience with messing around with a whole bunch of stuff in there. So this evening, what are we gonna cover? We're gonna look at an introduction to data science. It's, it's a real buzzword these days. So we're sort of gonna explain what that means and what the various elements of data science are. We'll then look at this technology called Azure Notebooks, which is an awesome way to investigate your data. We'll then look at machine learning and look at the Azure offering there, which is Azure ML Studio. So yeah, any stage, yell out any questions. So this is a brief history of data science. 1957, the, the uh, first data science tool, which was Fortran, great tool for scientific computing and crunching data. Did anyone else start their um, uh, journey on Fortran? Yeah, George up the back, yeah, a few people. Fortran was the first sort of scientific language I learned. Uh, 84, MATLAB came out, huge advance in scientific computing there. Um, I've also used uh, MATLAB uh, extensively and it's still uh, one of the preeminent tools in data crunching and machine learning. Excel, uh, the, this was the, two, uh, the release for Windows 2.2 .2 in 1987, and that really sort of uh, democratized um, data crunching. Uh, Python came along in 1991, a great tool for uh, analyzing your data in, and it, it's one of the most common tools today. The other one, is R, which came about in 1993. So you can see these tools have been around for a long, long, long time. Uh, 1996, data science was coined as a term. In the early 2000s, Google came along and blew away the other search engines and really showed the importance of using a data-centric approach to solving problems. And also software as a service really um, sort of connected a lot of data offerings where the quantitative community and also the, the sort of search and academic community, where a lot of these people started getting together, cross-pollinating ideas and releasing libraries. Uh, Pandas came out of um, AQR, which is a quantitative firm. And around this time period, around about the start of the GFC, you really started to see quantitative uh, people in the investment sphere starting to really dominate over the more qualitative people in that sphere. 2011, this uh, tool which we're going to look at tonight, which is uh, Jupyter Notebooks, was originally, originally released as IPython and obviously just supported Python. Uh, today it supports a huge array of languages. And in 2015, uh, Microsoft added support for this on the Azure platform. Does anyone else um, think there's any sort of seminal data science moments that I've missed? Cool, it's good. So what about you guys? What are you using for your data science? Who here is using Power BI? Yeah. <laughs> Not that many, okay. Probably only uh, maybe 20% of the room. Python? Cool, okay, a lot of Python newbies. So I'll go slow on the Python uh, front. Um, any R people? No. <laughs> R is such a hard language because it's sort of a back the front language where you have your assignment on the right hand side. R is a really common language and they've got a fair bit of feature parity. Is anyone here using Azure Machine Learning? 
Okay, just uh, George up the back. And there's also the, the, a bunch of other offerings like IBM Watson, AWS, Google, MATLAB. Anyone using any of these other tools? Okay, cool. Um, the MATLAB is a great tool if you, if you want to sort of go hardcore. So when you're about to engage in a data science project, um, what do you think the first step would be? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so who's got the mic? Daniel. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> first steps in a data science project? Collect data. Yeah, even before, even bef uh, so assuming you've sort of got a bunch of data lying around. Um, set up a development environment. No, even before that? Anyone else? Have a goal in mind? Absolutely, that's a great answer. <laughs> it's really easy to sort of grab data and start smashing around and do a bunch of correlations and all these advanced uh, statistical measures and end up with something that's entirely worthless to the stakeholders. So it's go to your stakeholders and say, what do you want to understand from this data set? What drives you? What, what answers can I provide you from this data set which will move the needle of your business or wh whatever environment you're in? So step one, is, uh, step zero, understand stakeholder motivations. Really important step which we often miss. You know, we sort of run away, we grab our data and, and you often see this in warehousing projects where you go dark for three months and you do ETL and cubing and uh, star schemas and then come back with a bunch of useless answers. So step zero, understand stakeholder uh, motivations. Next step is acquire data. This is a really challenging step too in lots of environments. Uh, in a lot of corporate environments, people hold on to their data for dear life. Uh, there's privacy concerns with data, security concerns. Even acquiring your data can be really hard. Step two, pre-processing and cleansing your data. These uh, first two steps can actually take up to 80% of your project. It's really unglamorous sort of uh, grinding work where you're dealing with um, two features of your data. Both the syntax of your data can be different, you know, as in date, time, expressed differently. And the, one of the more complex um, problems you get is different semantics of your data. What that means is your data in different environments can mean a different thing. So an order across two different departments in a company can mean a different thing, and a customer and a client, and you, you get all these data normalization issues. So getting the, your actual semantics of your data right can be really challenging. Uh, Nick, I just want to make a comment that I heard uh, a week or so ago to a client, and the client produces this um, beautiful purchase, like uh, kind of auto purchasing. So it tells the users what to purchase when yep. they're in, you know, and they've got so much data, they pull it all in and they kind of like auto complete. And it saves them a lot of money. And I said, are your customers happy when they buy your stuff? And, and he, he said, well, yeah, they are happy. And I said, they really enjoy the software. And he said, well, actually, we take so much time to actually get all their data together and then we clean it up. They're just happy they got all their data cleaned. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's the end outcome, not the product. Data cleansing and e even, yeah, I'll go through tonight. Data cleansing is such an unglamorous, it's fun, but it's sort of unglamorous sort of grunt work that's really needed. Uh, step three, when you get to the exciting stuff, analysing your data and getting insights. Step four, which we'll really drill into here, communicating the results is really critical to you know, get back to that step zero. And then step five, turning those um, insights into action. So that's where reporting will typically come in. So you'll do this data investigation phase and you'll say, look, I've discovered these interesting characteristics of your data. And then you'll employ typically a tool like Power BI, Tableau reporting services to then have that data published and available on, on an in an ongoing basis. So does that make sense? Does that sort of break up where the, the, this initial, initial investigation sits and where reporting sits? They're quite distinct activities. So you do the analysis, you work out what's interesting, and then you build the reports based on that. And also you can build machine learning and, and those type of outcomes. So what is data science? One really good definition I like is it's software engineering meets statistics. So a data science, a data scientist will typically know a lot more 
about uh, software engineering than a statistician and they will know a lot more about statistics than a software engineer. So it's sort of that hybrid between the two worlds. We covered a bit reporting versus data science. What's the difference? Reporting is once you know the answer and it's just making that data available on an ongoing basis. It involves exploring data in a structured way and we'll really dive into this in a minute and it's supported by an increasing array of tools. The tooling in this space is absolutely incredible. It grows every day. Um, it's a really exciting time in the data science space. This is a, a sort of really cool diagram which explains it all. So we've got, <laughs> I can't even say this word tonight, statistics coming in. We've got visualization, which is charting. We have got data mining, and I've put a, a definition there of data mining. It's sort of going into your data set and trying to work out patterns about what's happening in, in there. And it was a very popular thing sort of in the 90s. If you actually look at the um, Google search term, it, uh, data mining is dropping off, but it's still an important part of data science. Uh, I think it was also released in around SQL Server 2008, where we just we got our cubes, and then they gave us a second option, which was the data mining, and mm -hmm. uh, I think that was the um, uh, the diapers and beer. Yeah, to try and work out those relationships that aren't immediately apparent. So, so we'll go through a few of those uh, type things towards the end. Uh, new, uh, what have we got? Uh, so, uh, sorry, database and data processes. This is the stuff as software engineers we really know. This is defining schemas, ETL, and that type of thing. Neurocomputing, which is neural networks. So that's a branch of um, data science that takes inspiration from how neuro neurons work in the brain. So it feeds inputs through a bunch of uh, typically sort of uh, sigmoid uh, type functions and you'll get the end result and machine learning, which we'll cover in detail in a moment. So machine learning is greater than just neural networks. There's things like support vector machines and a whole bunch of algorithms, which we'll briefly cover. And then pattern recognition, which is a really common one now. Yeah, you can put your um, images in uh, Google search and you use that. And there's also automatic face recognition. And we'll show some funny examples of that later on. So it's a brief introduction to data science. Hopefully that makes a bit more sense where data science fits in the overall world of um, software engineering, st statistics, and um, uh, the, the IT industry. Does that make sense? Everyone happy with that? A bit clearer? Cool. So now we're going to jump into Azure Notebooks. So here's a question. What is the most popular uh, data analyst tool in the world today? Yeah. Excel, absolutely, by a long way. P Python is, is sort of a, a great tool, but in terms of the number of people, if you look at a sort of um, yeah, per capita measure, Excel uh, leads the way. So what are the limitations of Excel? Absolutely. So rows are limited. You, you can only go down, is it 32,000 rows still or something like that. Uh, it, it makes it very hard to um, analyse very big data sets. Yeah, sort of a standard joke that big data is anything that doesn't fit in an Excel uh, worksheet. <laughs> it's typically 2D only, um, which sucks. It's really hard to express 3D relationships in um, or multi-dimensional relationships in Excel. It's, it's largely bound to a rich client. While you can obviously have Office 365, you still see that, uh, that um, <coughs> emailed spreadsheets are a really common way to express results. And that sucks. It really sucks because you know, the spreadsheets just sort of branch and you know, no one knows where the source of truth is. Anyone got any other shortcomings? Lack of advanced algorithms? Yeah, sorry. We, um, all, your, um, all your logic is um, hidden behind the GUI and you can't version control it easily. Well, it goes back to your saying of uh, how branching works, but your intellectual property is sort of not in plain sight. Absolutely. That is the perfect answer. And it's actually, oh, 
Is it here? Yes, you got the last point. You could win like on that um, Family Feud. Yeah, you, you got the thing worth um, yeah, 28 points or something. Yeah, good work. Uh, hidden calculations, I think, is the greatest problem in Excel. As this picture demonstrates. So what's this? Where is this and what are they doing? Adam. I'm not sure, but I recognise the Greek words there. Yeah. So it's a riot in Greece. Anyone guess what it's over? They have to pay tax. And Absolutely. <laughs> the uh, enforced austerity measures that came courtesy of the Troika, the um, European Central Bank, the IMF, and who was the other member of the Troika? Uh, ECB, IMF, and World Bank enforced austerity in Greece. Does anyone know the, the funny story behind that? It's probably hilarious for the Greek patients that died of cancer not being able to get treatment. But it is the Excel era that changed history. So these two academic authors, Reinhardt and uh, Rogoff, published a seminal study which showed when the, uh, GDP, the debt to GDP ratio of a country exceeded 90%, in every case since World War II, that country started, their, their economy contracted. So what this inspired, the, the Troika, to say, Greece, you've got to shed all this debt, uh, else your economy will never grow. You'll always be contracting. And the, um, the data that these authors used, they were very uh, hesitant to give up. They finally gave up their Excel calculation spreadsheets and what they found was they'd made an Excel mistake. So what happened <laughs> is they accidentally excluded five rows. So, so this is a Bloomberg link. Um, the, the, this slide deck will be available later. But they accidentally excluded five rows from their calculations. It was just a drop and drag error when they were doing all, all, all their academic research. And when, once this error was fixed, it actually found that these economies on average grew by 0.02% rather than contracted by minus 0.1%. So isn't that funny? The whole <laughs> austerity thing and these riots are based on missing five rows in an Excel uh, calculation error. I don't think that would help them anyway. <laughs> yeah, Greece is a basket. But, but it, it's a, I think this is a prototypical example of these hidden calculations. Anyone who's ever tried to uh, debug an Excel spreadsheet and you, you put out that colour and there's arrows pointing, you know, it looks like a game of snakes and ladders. Where the hell do you start? It's so hard. Uh, not to be outdone, who's read this book, Capital in the 21st Century by Thomas Piketty? Yeah. Did you, did you know about the problem with his calculations? The control Did you enjoy the book? Uh, uh, hold on, hold on. I'm going to give you a mic. Um, in part. So, yeah, yeah. I, I found it got very tedious and repetitive. Yeah, um, needed a good edit kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, I, I found um, maybe it's a translation from French, maybe the French are more long-winded. Uh, it's a great book and it, it makes some very important arguments about the uh, intergeneration transfer of wealth and how that embeds inequality. And again, this guy had problems with his Excel calculations, <laughs> which you can go to this link and read about tomorrow. Basically what he did, he had a bunch of sort of hard-coded corrections in there. Um, so he just plucked these magic numbers out of the air to uh, correct his numbers. And these numbers tended to change from year to year and they coincidentally backed up his arguments. Uh, credit to the author that he made these uh, spreadsheets available on his web website, but there was no explanation why he was using a different um, correction factor magically for different years. And th this uh, controversy has significantly, um, yeah, a lot of, there was a lot of detractors to his work where he's arguing, yeah, that if you're very rich, uh, you can't give that money to your kids because that'll um, in, in, you know, really increase inequality. Um, there were a lot of people obviously opposed to these ideas and they used this Excel error um, to really hammer him. Huge controversy related to this very influential publication. So what's the solution? It is to make your calculations very 
transparent. And that's where Jupyter comes in. So Jupyter is a solution to this problem. It's an open source web application. As we said before, 2011 it came out, started as IPython, and now has been extended to a truckload of languages, which I'll cover in a minute. It is awesome for creating and sharing documents. And the great thing about this is you have got live code equations and visualizations. So your findings, your calculations and your charts are all in line, which makes uh, finding these errors, detecting these errors and discussing these errors a lot more easier than downloading an Excel, uh, Excel worksheet off someone's website, putting on that um, you know, show calculations arrow view and trying to debug it that way. I think it's awesome. So what it supports, data cleansing, transformation, numerical simulations, <laughs> statistical modeling, machine learning, and much more. So heaps of languages. I briefly, this is from the website. So it's page one of the languages supported, page two, page three, page four. So just briefly reading through some of these, you've obviously got Python, language, bash, um, Perl, MATLAB, um, uh, Lua, schema, C, TAQL, coconut, common lisp, um, uh, whole heap uh, node, TypeScript, Pike, Singular, uh, there's C Sharp somewhere in there. So just a, a whole bunch of languages supported C. Um, so the, these are um, Jupyter kernels and they'll support a bunch of different languages. This is what it looks like. This is an example uh, which we'll uh, dive into momentarily. So we have some, uh, some text which explains, just some commentary. We have got a formula and then we've got the output of those results. Does that look cool? I'll quickly dive into it. Hey, who, who has seen a Jupyter notebook before? Okay, uh, not many. So I'll quickly dive in. I think these are so awesome. So I've logged in here to the um, Azure portal and I'll add a new one. So this is Sydney. Net. The next thing I do is select my language. Oh, sorry. Let me, um, let, I think I'll jump out of my slide deck, which will go back to mirroring. Excellent. Can you guys see that? Cool. So Sydney, so I've gone into, let me start again, gone into my um, Azure Notebooks portal gone into a particular library, and I'm getting a new one up. So I s Sydney, and these are free currently. There's absolutely no cost, they're still in preview. Sydney.net, UG. And the next thing I do is pick my language. So the supported languages on um, Azure are the two versions of Python, 2.7 and 3.5, R and F Sharp, which they added uh, two months ago. So I'm going to go ahead and select Python 3.5 and create that. And I will launch it. So, sorry? Hold, hold on. Yeah, yeah, this one's Python 3. So there's a Python 3 notebook. So I've got two types of cells in here. I've got a code cell and a markdown. The rest of these are sort of legacy settings. So in my code cells, I can do very simple calculations, two plus two, and I'm gonna hit control enter now, and it will run that cell. You can see that little, um, on my input, it turned into uh, an asterisk while I was calculating, and then it output the result. So I'll insert another cell below that, and instead of just outputting the result, I'll assign it to a variable. So A equals 2 plus 2. So that'll store that variable, control enter. And then I can insert another cell and then just output, output that variable, which is 4. Very, very, very simple um, stuff. But as you can see, each of these cells uh, build on each other. So you can gradually build up expressions and calculations. I'll change this cell to markdown, and I can just do my traditional markdown stuff like um, 
uh, in a wiki or in my git markdown file. Um, certain image or something like that. Just normal markdown, right? Nothing greatly exciting, but uh, control enter on that and I've got a heading cell. So you can see here I've got my uh, commentary text, my formulas and the output of those formulas all in line. I'll just go and grab I normally do this in my Parallels desktop, but to get the monitors all working, I've gone to native Mac. But I've got some text I want in here. So let me just start this up. And what I'm going to show you is the very limited debugging support. That's usually uh, people's first question coming from is that that's there? No, sorry, it's crashed. Um, the debugging support's very limited. You, all you've basically got is that printf style debugging experience where, where like here, I've output the variable of A. They're working on better debugging support, better uh, collaboration support, but right now it is quite a tedious um, exercise to debug. Uh, your options, you can um, actually code in um, a technology like the um, Iron Python in Visual Studio and then cut and paste your code here if you've got complex debugging issues. I can import um, a whole bunch of standard um, libraries like uh, NumPy as NP and bring that in. So that will make any of my uh, NumPy functionality available. So if I insert another cell below, I do get limited IntelliSense. So if I do NP dot and then Alt tab, I will get all the um, NumPy functionality there. Not great, but it is not horrendous either. So if I want to do NumPy at dot control enter, And it gives me a little bit of auto completion. So if I want the absolute value of minus two, obviously that's two. So really basic functionality like that's available. You can either import data directly into your uh, workbook. You can choose that from Dropbox. And you can bring about, I think it's a four gig limit of data in there. Or you can just link to any publicly available data source, which is what we'll do. These are the kernels. So you could change this kernel to Python 2. I think all this syntax is legal in Python 2. So I'm restarting and running that kernel. You can see all that output still worked in um, Python 2. Obviously, uh, F sharp and R won't be compatible with this language syntax. So it's quite simple. You can download the, these uh, workbooks. So this is a native format for Jupyter, this IPYND, or you can export it to Markdown or even uh, PDF. And your other option for presentation is you can, um, where is it? You can do a slideshow, which I've just lost at the moment. Bit better? Much better. Awesome, but maybe a bit too much. Cool, so th this is a, the base, uh, uh, very basics of um, Jupyter. Really simple, but you can build some really complex um, documents in this. Uh, it's one, one of the, the huge um, users of um, these notebooks are quantitative finance people. Um, has anyone here he, he heard of Quantopian? Yeah. So uh, Quantopian is a platform, and they recently got a truckload of money, like a quarter of a billion dollars or something, from um, Stephen A. Cohen, SAC Capital Advisors fame, who got investigated by the um, 
SEC for insider trading. So this guy's got like $10 billion and can't trade other people's money. So he's given um, about a quarter uh, invested in Quantopian. You can go in there in, and in these notebooks um, define trading algorithms. They can then run your algorithm live against a, a variety of markets. And if that starts making money, you get 10%. So it sort of really uh, democratizes um, quantitative finance. So if you've got an algorithm that's you know, significant and printing out money with absolutely no risk and no capital um, investment by you, you can make some serious dough. Um, they've got some great lectures on there too. If you want to understand more about quantitative finance, you can go in here, this is Quantopian, and log in. Okay, if you go to learn, and lectures, they have got a, these are all um, IPython, IPython notebooks. You can go in here, and there is a massively long lecture series. Where does it go out to? 46 lectures. Um, and you could almost teach yourself to be a quantitative finance person here. So you can go in here, clone these notebooks. Hopefully that's coming up. Excellent. So this is a lecture in Quantopia about the dangers of overfitting. So you can see here, here's some markdown. What is overfitting? Uh, nice table. And then they go in, bring in NumPy and a bunch of libraries, do a bunch of calculations and show you various um, types of overfitting. So you can see here, here's a, the blue line underfit, the green line a good fit, and the red line overfit, which squiggles through every point. So you can go in here, you can, so th this is in my library now. I've cloned this and brought it across, and I can go in and then um, experiment with any of these variable things. So this is a really good way. Yeah, and the other really common use case, obviously, is lectures. Yeah, if I'm a, a, a professor, I can publish one of these Jupyter notebooks and my students can come in here and learn. You can see this is you know, really taking hold in some university courses. Who else thinks this is really cool? Awesome, yeah, most of you. Oh, I think it's awesome. They actually, um, and a funny thing is Quantopia actually did a data science experiment, so it's like a meta data science type thing. They looked at, there's two um, surfaces in Quantopia. There's this research surface where you can go in and look at the data. And the other thing you can do is uh, define algorithms. So algorithms are actually um, uh, how you do a trade. So there's a really simple algorithm, moving average crossover, if anyone does trading. So this is when like the 15 days above the 30 day, you buy and vice versa. So th this is uh, some Python code to do a library. So what they found is the people that just come in here and throw algorithms at the wall and hope they stick, so you can actually run this back test here against, um, so he's running it for a full year. Um, what they found is people that just go in and write random, um, random algorithms significantly underperformed the, the um, quantitative uh, scientists who spent a lot of time in research. They found the most successful quants spent about 90% of their time in research understanding the data and then we'll come over and express their models. So you can see here this, um, this model here of moving over cross, moving average crossover uh, significantly underperformed the S&P and it lost money, lost um, minus, uh, minus 6.8% when run over this time frame. <coughs> so that's pretty cool, I think. So let's go back see where we are with our yes George 
Yeah. Uh, what are my options for getting external data into a notebook? Um, the, the most common is like a read CSV into a pandas data frame, uh, which is what I'm going to show. Um, I'm looking for something a bit more substantial, yeah, 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 like you can, uh, streaming. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so you event can look, hubs. Yeah, you, you can look, link to Azure. Um, I don't know if it's got like Spark support, um, but you can definitely link to Azure databases. Uh, Hadoop, something like this. Yeah, I think so. I, I haven't used that. Um, typically, you won't use it for very high volumes of data, but um, I haven't looked at whether you can hook to like Azure Data Lakes or something like that. But uh, how they do financial calculations if it, it cannot be used for high volumes of data? Uh, so, so in for Quantopia, they've got their own uh, libraries, which then just make that available. So they've got both um, tick level data for the NYC and also uh, level two. So the, uh, the actual order book. Um, so is notebook can be made um, continuous? Like if I'm looking at event hub that is streaming data, can I continuously refine my model, continuously recalculate? Or is uh, you could, but that's not the typical use case. You typically use something else. Um, uh, like uh, Quantopian, when, when they go live, they don't run in notebooks, they run in that other modeling mode. So, so it's similar, but typically like data investigation is the primary use case for these notebooks. And then you, you use that finding and convert that Python code into something like, yeah. Um, so th there's a rich um, support for the Python and R data processing libraries. If there's a library that isn't there, you can just use the standard Python syntax a lot like NuGet, uh, the, the Python equivalent is pip. So you just do a pip install and bring in whatever library you need. Uh, the team are pretty responsive. If you can't get access to a library, just uh, put a question on their GitHub and they're quite helpful. Currently in preview, and w one of the great benefits of um, Jupyter, or the Azure implementation, is it's got Microsoft's cognitive toolkit available in there as one of your libraries. So this is typically what you see with Jupyter uh, installations, you get the bare bones, which are available on, on a massive number of platforms, and then you get the value add stuff. Uh, for Microsoft, it's the um, CNTK. So to take advantage of all that Cortana style stuff. So let's go back to our steps in a data science project. Right now, this session is being streamed on SSW TV. Adam, over there, cares about SSW TV and invests a lot of money in it. And we had a discussion earlier this year. What drives our viewership in SSW TV? D does that summarize your business problem, yes. Adam? Cool. And, and I had the belief that uh, we should be doing lots of shorter videos rather than longer videos. Yeah. And a few people didn't agree with me. So the question is, Adam's motivation is what drives SSW TV views and likes, which is the main sort of YouTube metric um, and, 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 and other stuff. Yeah, eyeballs on screen type time. What do you care about most? What uh, metric? Oh, I care well, probably more about views, I guess. Yeah. So a view in YouTube is only 30 seconds. So if, if eight hour long video, you watch the first 30 seconds and that counts as a view. Nearly everyone cares about views, likes and dislikes because that's the, the central metric that all your other viewers see on that screen. Uh, we don't monetize SSW TV, but I think a lot of that uh, works on views as well, as well as ad impressions. But views and likes, because they're so prominent in that YouTube display right below the video, everyone really cares about that typically. So how do we acquire data for YouTube for our channel? It's analytics.youtube.com. There is an API. Um, it is currently not whitelisted for the Jupyter Notebooks, so you can't call it. And I had a heap of trouble trying to get OAuth working with that too. So when the poor man's option, which is to download the, um, the CSV, the analytics CSV, and I just whacked it in a publicly uh, accessible spot in Dropbox so I can bring it in. That's how I got my data. Pre-processing and cleaning, which we'll dive into right now. So we open the notebook, we import it, and there's always a lot of noise and missing, data, and missing data. So we've got to deal with that. There's a number of ways we can deal with that missing data. 
We can set it to zero, it's a really common way. We can remove the row entirely and there's a whole bunch of really cool um, infer inference toolkits to deal with that missing data. Uh, MICE is um, the most advanced one where you can go in and say, while this column is missing, why don't you go and look at all the other columns and make a guess of what data we should put in that column. So you can actually do advanced inference to in your notebook. We analyze the data, which is typically graphs and um, calculations, and then we communicate the results, which is annotations and commentary um, and discussions, and then turn those insights into action. So let's go in. This is my demo man. He's cool. Adam doesn't like the word demo, so I found this, uh, oh, this cool demo man. Um, I searched for demo man, and this guy blows stuff up rather than does demonstrations, but I thought he was cool. So this is my um, prompt to go and do a demo. So let me go into Safari and open up the analysis which I've done. And I might start this again from scratch. So this is an actual real life document which we've used internally in SSW to discuss what drives views and likes in SSW TV. Um, so I've brought in an image here to make it look a bit nice. I've done some descriptive text about what SSW TV is. A lot of that yeah, is the stuff I just mentioned to you before. And then I'm explaining what I'm doing here because no one else in the company was that familiar. I'm doing data analysis with Python, so I'm explaining what I'm doing. So here's my first calculation cell. Is that visible at the back? That's okay. I'll right, make it a bit bigger. I'm bringing in all the Python libraries. So this is very typical, uh, very uh, analogous to C Sharp where I'm bringing in libraries, just setting up some plotting options. And here's my first calculation. So I'm actually reading in all of my, this, this is the first um, workbook that comes, uh, sorry, worksheet that comes out of Google Analytics. And I'm reading that in to our Pandas data frame. This is a really common way to process data. It's got some great functionality which makes uh, slicing your data really good. You can see here I've got a really easy sort by. So I'm sorting by video length and dot head will give me back the first five rows in that uh, data frame. It's a really common way, you know, just let's have a look at our data and get sort of some gut feel. So here's the five shortest videos. This is an output cell. These are five shortest videos on SSW TV. And these are the columns I've got. So I've got publication date, tags, uh, when it was created, length, whole bunch. I think I've got, and will tell me down here, I've got a, a total of 58 different columns that I've got to make sense of. So this is Cameron, and he said, video length is critical. Don't expect me to click on anything over five minutes. He was very uh, adamant that short videos were the way to go. And so we got the data and investigated that. So this, this, is, this is how hard it is. It's actually really easy. Hopefully that, yeah. So I'm doing, I'm calling dot plot on my data frame, my video length in minutes against views. And this is what we got it was entirely chaotic. There was absolutely no relationship apparent at all. Um, this, these few outliers, Adam's very popular, so I got a very popular video here on Power BI, which has got over, or, yeah, over 120,000 views. But you can see here, and, and this, so this was our most popular video, and it was over 100 minutes long, which totally sort of threw conventional wisdom on its head. Does that surprise? Surprised people in Canberra last night. Maybe Sydney's more cynical. I don't know. You can see the, these few outliers really threw this graph out. So I, I also plugged, plotted it on a logarithmic scale. Uh, is anyone here uh, not familiar with logarithmic scales? Cool. Yeah, okay. So logarithmic scales you'll typically use when there's outliers and it will express data on an order, order of magnitude basis. So it's probably a bit hard to see but this is you know, 10 to the power of. So we're basically looking at order of magnitude comparisons 
rather than uh, direct numerical. Um, and you can see here again, really clear relationship. Yeah, not f second. Um, so then what's the, um, the measure which we would use to inspect these two relationships in, in stats? No, no, no. So, so what, what st uh, st 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 stat measure uh, gives me the, st the strength of the relationship between two variables? Basic stat. Correlation. Correlation. Absolutely. So I calculated the correlation between these two, and it's unfamiliar, which Adam said it would be, and he was right. So this, here's some brief explanation of correlation. So here is... Um, here is a relationship that's highly correlated. This is the relationship between sun hat sales and daily average temperature. Something you would expect to be really correlated. When it's hot, people buy a lot of hats. Relationship between pie sales, and I think it's a US thing where pi equals pizza, goes down. And here's TV sales and average temperature. Totally uncorrelated data. So in this case, we're seeing data which is highly correlated. In this case, it's negatively correlated. So you'd have a correlation of uh, around minus 0.8. And here you'd have some correlation approaching zero. You can actually do really funny things with correlation if you're sort of uh, mathematically inclined. This is a uh, number of people who drown by falling in swimming pools correlated with the number of films Nicolas Cage appeared in. Looks pretty highly related. You can see that um, when uh, Cage does a lot of movies, like in 2007, a lot more people drown in pools. It's got a 0.66 correlation. Here's another funny one. The divorce rate in Maine compared to the per capita consumption of margarine, even more correlated. So you've got to be careful with correlation. This is a site where you can get all these weird and wacky um, correlation jokes from. Someone actually predicted the um, US S&P returns for ages, yeah, okay, um, I think for a 40 year period based on the Bangladeshi butter production. So we go back to Safari. So you can see here, our views and video length was really <coughs> uncorrelated, which surprised everyone. So then the next argument was whether um, likes were it all correlated to, um, to um, video length. And we did that one. And again, nothing. Absolutely nothing. Correlation here was a bit stronger at 0.15, but still very much in the random sphere. So again, this is how we do it. Just dot. This is where, um, if you did this in Excel, you would have an array of cells yeah, you'd have like A2 to A500 compared to B2 to B500. Really hidden, opaque calculation. When I do it here on a, a data frame, it's a really clean way of expressing this. Anyone can go in here and see, I haven't stuffed this up. And if I have stuffed this up, it, it's usually um, quite apparent. And so this is a public notebook, so anyone else in SSW or the whole world could go in and clone this notebook and change my calculations if they thought I was making the wrong assumption. So then, then once we realise the video length doesn't really matter, the, the <coughs> next question is, what maximises the sort of number of minutes of um, eyeballs on screen time for us? So YouTube's got some great stuff in there, and that gives us our, I'll just go down to here, this gives us our average percentage viewed. What I wanted to do here, and this is where um, really Python begins to leave um, Excel behind. I can then bring in another really simple library, which is um, sklearn. I'm importing the linear model from that. I want to do, it's a bit confusing. I want to do a polynomial model based on this out of this linear regression library. I just want to do um, a quadratic model. So I do it by length of video in minutes and the length of video in minutes squared. And all I do is then ask that to fit that model. The R squared coefficient is a measure of how good this model is for the data. And all this other code is just plotting it out. So if I go in here, 
I've got a graph. So this is a video length in minutes compared to the average percentage view. This makes a lot of intuitive sense, right? That for very short videos, people get about 80% of the way through. For very long videos, uh, they only get about 10% the average view, average view duration. But you can see here, we, we sort of reach a bit of a stable point around here. Around 40 to 60 minutes, people sort of hang in there the same percentage. So that sort of gives us an indication. If we, if we want um, people to get about halfway through the videos on average, we do it around 20 minutes. So this gives us a really clean, easy to understand indication of how our efforts pay off in terms of video length. Once we get way out here to 80 minutes, we're only getting a 10% average view rate. So that answers sort of a question. You know, maybe you could argue the ideal length is around maybe this 20 minutes because that, that gives us about 30%. But if you look at this, the, um, look at this sort of inverted, this is the average view, average view duration in minutes compared to the video length. You can see here that it continues to climb, right? And that makes sense, because a uh, 100 minute video will get around this sort of 10% average, 10 minutes watched. And if we go out here to 120 minutes, we get about 12% watched. So if we, if we want to actually maximize eyeballs on screen time, we do really long videos because it doesn't really drop off after that. There's no reason, you can see this is pretty static after 40 minutes. So there's no real benefit in chopping videos up in, in, into halves type thing, which was a key, um, a key finding for our company. The chopping videos up probably wouldn't give us that much help in terms of views and likes, which was surprising because we'd already started chopping videos up uh, preemptively based on guesswork. I think, is, is that correct? Yes, we still are. <laughs> yeah, we still are. <laughs> Even though I've given him all this data, he doesn't believe me. So, uh, this is just some commentary on that. This is a total watch time in hours per video. Again, this is really easy to plot. Um, and again, a few videos really blow this out of the water. And they're at the longer time scale. So in terms of the total number of hours we've got on screen, this, um, we've got 250,000 hours, sorry, 25,000 hours of Adam being watched on that Power BI talk. One of the limitations here, it's really hard to get tooltip um, type things that um, I tried and it didn't work, that Excel gives you sort of for free. So that, that's one limitation there. It'd be really nice to have tooltips for these videos. Um, it might be a little bit uh, unrelevant, but then uh, there is a TED Talk thing, like it's a, uh, like people come and talk and then uh, it has to be 18 minutes and there's a science behind it why it's 18 minutes. So it's actually uh, true that around 18 minutes is, uh, is a good time for a, a okay, cool. for a talk. Yeah. And that's based on a whole bunch of behavioral studies, I'd imagine? Uh, yep. Yeah, excellent. Uh, I think it has something to do with, to do with per persuasion. So with uh, precision. <laughs> yeah, cool. Yep. Uh, George, behind you. Did you say 18 minutes? Uh, yes. 80. 18. Oh, 18. 18. 18. Um, there are a few studies. If Adam bothered to uh, study marketing uh, in marketing, basically behavioral science, nothing to do with the yep. use. The idea is there are a few critical numbers. I don't remember, like not uh, five, nine, eighteen, something else, yep. and then like one hour, and the easiest one to explain is actually one hour. So someone opens YouTube and say, okay, I'm now committed to watch it, so I'm gonna set aside time to watch it. Yeah. And they go and watch the whole yeah. 60 minutes. Whilst if you give them 10 minutes, they start watching and say, ah, whatever. Yeah. Right, in between chewing on- Yeah, lunch, and, yeah. And coffee break, 12 min uh, I think 12 minutes uh, explainable by a break. Yep. So people watch it and break. Yeah, and drink similar. a coffee, probably 12 yeah, minutes. Yeah, yeah, coffee break and something like this. So there is behavioral, the whole awesome. behavioral science behind it. Yeah. And longer videos actually do make sense because people actually commit to watching it. Yeah, absolutely. Like I know the way I, like if it's a long video, I'll go to um, that video download site, download it off YouTube, um, whatever the site, I can't remember. Um, yeah. Yes. Sorry? The illegal stuff. Yeah, well, I don't know. How <laughs> it's great, great, great area. Um, and then watch it on the train or something. Yeah, for, for longer videos. Just so I can fast forward easier and stuff like that. So, 
Then content tags. This is Adam. I'm sort of paraphrasing here because I'm not even sure he said this, but it's funny when you put words in people's mouth because you believe this. So our videos have great metadata. We should be able to work out the most popular presenters, topics and events, exclamation mark, exclamation mark. So we have got that data. Um, you, if you remember up here, we have tags applied to all our videos. In this column here, a whole bunch of tags and they're applied to every single video. So it sort of seems to be suggesting that content is very important. So let's try and analyze that. What are our topics? that bring the most people in. So we've got the data to go and do that. Let me just scroll back down. So this is where our tags are stored. They're actually not even visible in, um, in the YouTube UI. They're just um, search tags, which is sort of hidden in the markup. Um, we actually looked at uh, an another screen in, um, in uh, YouTube analytics and very, a very small amount of, of our traffic is driven by these search terms. They're not overly important. But I could use these as a sort of um, de facto way to work out what a topic is, right? It's the only data I've got, so I may as well use it. So let's go and look at how we do that. This is where it gets quite uh, complex. So this is some, um, what I'm doing here, you can see that tags was in one, one cell, or sorry, one column. So what I need to do, I needed to strip out, this was just getting rid of the white space. I'm then uh, splitting it on that string. I'm excluding the first and last character. This syntax here I really like in Python. The minus one is one back from the end of the array. So you don't need to do that um, len array minus one, which you need to do in nearly every other language and you often get errors related to that. Um, and then I'm using the tags column. So I throw this in a pandas series. I can then, this is really nice syntax. Doing this in Excel would be, again, all these hidden calculations. I can just say count the values that occur in there. I know there's a whole heap of generic tags, like we put SSW on every video, so that's useless. So what I'm doing here, if it appears more than, we've got about 350 videos. If it's in more than 200 of them, I'm gonna throw it out. It's a useless tag. So this is a filtering in uh, pandas. And then I'll just reset it all to zero and reuse this series to count the number of uh, views against a topic. I actually, and I've got an error here. Let me just try and run that again. So you can see here, this is a very slow calculation and I've got this um, little asterisk tells me that this cell is calculating. So here I'm doing, um, uh, yeah, this is the equivalent of a T-SQL cursor. Um, so you can see I've started very simply just doing basic calculations and now I'm bringing in this T-SQL-like functionality, which is really uh, powerful. Um, T-SQL is probably my language of choice for data crunching, but again, that's really opaque, right? Like how do you express T-SQL results to the outside world? Just copy and paste them and, um, hope and yeah, hope people trust you with those results. So, so I'll quickly just go, this is what we got as the 15 most popular terms. So we had stuff like scrum, technology, system, training, office, how to. Like these terms weren't overly useful. Were, were these useful to you, Adam? Not really, they were yeah. useless. Yeah, pretty much useless. So what we found is the way we were tagging our data isn't useful at all. Our 15 least uh, here's some, um, some syntax for, um, this is tail, which gives me the bottom of the array. These are our 15 uh, most least popular terms that have only got like 30 or 40 views. Surprised on this one, cloud computing didn't get many views, but this just could be a case of how we tag the data. So what we've, we, we've um, realized out of this is that our tagging is inaccurate and it's very hard for us to predict, other than gut feel, what's going to be popular topics. The, the only themes really that came out was Scrum and Power BI were, were uh, popular topics, which you already knew, right? So, Zen, so this is Yuli. Again, I'm putting words in his mouth. But he um, hypothesized 
the publication cadence is important. So people will notice if we publish a lot of videos, we'll get a really great interaction. So the guys in the video production team, which are at the back now, they should really aim to publish a lot of videos. So Adam's first question is, what does our publication cadence on a monthly basis look like? Again, I could really easily answer that. So here's some more T-SQL-like syntax. I can use group by, which comes out of the Pandas library. I'm doing it by year and month, and I just want the count of videos published. And this is just um, graphing data. So here's what our publication cadence looks like. Since the beginning of 2014, we published between about 30 videos, which we did for Microsoft Ignite in February, and some months we only did one where we're working on a very complex video. Um, so it's all over the place, which is good for um, stats. If, if it was even, we wouldn't get any type of, yeah, you know, e everything would be the same and we couldn't make any um, observations based on this data. So now what we want to do is based on a daily basis, split that data between well, what's a really quiet month where we might do one, two or three, what's an average month where we do three to six and what's a crazy busy month. And in those months, do we get any changes in our data patterns? So here's the code to do that. I needed to bring in our date data. So I've brought in another data frame here. So this is from obviously another um, worksheet out of Google Analytics. You can see here, this is what my data looks like. This is the top of the data. So on the 2nd of March, we had um, about 10,000 uh, minutes of total view time. Here are the views and um, somewhere in that data is the number of likes. So what, if, what I can then go do, again, a lot like T-SQL, I can then do a, a join on this data. All this is just cleaning up the dates so they match up. And I'll, here I'm doing the setting the index. What this will give me is the equivalent of an outer join on our data. So I'll get a lot of um, empty values, the equivalent of nulls. I, I can then go in and fix that up. Here's me just cleaning up the data frame getting rid of a bunch of columns. And what I can do is I can express, this is really cool functionality. I've resampled this onto a weekly um, time frame rather than daily. Because daily is not really relevant, right? Um, you've got UTC issues and weekends and all that crap. I only care about weeks. So here's my final data set. For each week since the beginning of 2012, I have the total watch time in minutes, the number of views, subscribers gained, and the videos published. So you can see in this week here, February 2012, I had two videos published, 79 um, total views. So I can then go in, use that group by expression. I can cut up my data set into bins. The bins I chose were zero to three, three to six, and six to 100 and I call those quite busy and crazy weeks. So again, if, we, if you're doing this in Excel, this would be a whole bunch of um, cell calculations, which is really difficult to um, understand. Here I've done it in one line in um, Python, and I think this is a lot more transparent. You can go in here and without a lot of effort, understand what's happening. When I do this grouping, I wanna take the mean, and here's our final result. So this is total watch time in minutes compared to quite busy and crazy weeks. Nothing. Our quiet weeks, we actually had the most view time. So the argument that we should artificially control and monitor the cadence at which we publish videos was totally debunked. Which is a good outcome, right? It means it, this is a cost saving based on this data analysis. And uh, similarly, we, we actually get more subscribers in quite weeks. So uh, Yuli, who's the Scrum Master, um, is always trying to push them to... Does he know about these results? Uh, yes, and hopefully he's watching on live stream too. I, I have briefly talked to him. So until... Well, because he's always uh, pushing the video team to... that they have to publish every single week because I think he's heard that if you publish something every week, you get more subscribers. Yeah. So he was, for, for some years he's been pushing them, but we always have our definition of done, and so that's why that, it changes a lot. Yeah, and you can see here based on this analysis, 
in our quiet weeks, we actually get more subscribers. It, it, it's just not a factor. So, and that's the conclusion. So that, that's how far we've got with our data. So, um, what we're going to do now, I, I, in terms of you know, the um, business outcomes from this study, is we're going to tag our data properly and try and rerun this analysis to work out the presenters, events, and topics which are really driving views. So that's a good, um, good outcome. Wouldn't you want uh, uh, to try to analyze actually the efforts required to produce the video? Obviously, mm -hmm. the uh, the video of two minutes requires a bit less efforts than uh, um, producing 50 videos during the Ignite week. Or well, uh, just to correct you, George, uh, well, first of all, you're right with the Ignite that nearly killed the guys. Uh, they were working almost r right around the clock to produce that many videos. But shorter videos usually take the guys a lot longer than the longer ones. Um, and I think it would be interesting, uh, the animated videos, when they do some of uh, the animation ones, what is a product owner and what is a scrum master, yeah. I would guess the animation ones probably get more views as well, but we've never analysed that. Yeah, and we haven't got the metadata on those videos either to make that analysis possible. So this is a really common um, outcome in data science that you are missing data. And again, how long it takes to produce a video, that um, data is really hidden too. We, we can't uh, get that data really easily um, at all. Um, yeah. Maybe we make the video guys enter timesheets like the software developers. <laughs> <laughs> so quickly summarising this Asian notebook, great tool for data cleansing, analysis and presentation, code and commentary in line. And if someone wants to dispute your results, they go in there and clone it and are free to uh, do what they want. Pretty cool. I really like this surface, uh, yeah, the, 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 this environment for analysing data. I, I, I'm not a, a, a fluent Python programmer. C sharp and T SQL by nature. So I was you know, programming here by Stack Overflow, but I got there in the end. Uh, we got a question coming from online and, and made a good point whether the uh, results that we're seeing are skewed by the outliers. So um, I challenge the querier, the skeptic, to just go and claim this notebook to filter out those videos that have got potentially more than um, these uh, maybe more than um, 10,000 uh, total minutes of view time and repeat the analysis. That's a great beauty of this, that it's very easy to uh, build on someone else's work. So right now we're going to delve into uh, machine learning. So right, right now we, we've done the first bit. We've looked at uh, data science and we looked at Azure Notebooks as a way of exploring your data. So now we're going to look at how to make this data actionable. One of the key ways to make data actionable is machine learning, where we hope to get some type of predictions or classifications out of our data. Has anyone used machine learning out in the wild? Excellent. Cool. We've got a few people to uh, do it here. I tried uh, for about a year to get a project up on machine learning. Um, based on the characteristics of a Git repo. Often you'll look at a Git repo and you'll see a team's really struggling. There'll be uh, the pull requests will have no commentary, the developers will be working in isolation and there might, might, may even be commits directly on master. They're not using pull requests at all. Trying to correlate that to um, how that code works in production, we found to be a really difficult thing because we just had to spend so much time manually stitching the data together and our, our, the amount of data we had wasn't uh, big enough. So machine learning has got a long and very rich history. Goes way back to 1952. Um, the first learning program was written to play checkers. What um, distinguishes a machine learning uh, program from a traditional procedural program is the rules aren't hard coded. They adapt to the environment. So 67, nearest neighbour was developed for image recognition. And then we went into what's called the first AI winner, where a lot of the initial hype early on resulted in a lot of projects um, failing and the funding and the amount of talent going into AI really fell off in the 70s. 
Uh, came back in the early 80s, I guess um, Reagan throwing a lot of money into defence probably helped a bit there. Uh, a self-navigating robot, 79. 1980s, back propagation was actually rediscovered and had some commercial application. In the 1990s, computing power really expanded and that let these systems go from traditional knowledge-based systems, like where it was just decision trees, almost if then else, into really the world of data, where you could hold enough on your hard disk and in RAM to make these database systems really uh, feasible. Um, 97, <coughs> it really hit the headlines with Deep Blue um, beating the world chess champion, uh, Gary uh, Kaspinov. 2006, does anyone know about the Netflix prize? They offered, I think, a million dollars to anyone who could uh, beat their recommender system by more than 10%. And that was eventually won in, I think, 2009, from memory. Heap of money being thrown at data science. Uh, Microsoft came out with the Kinect in 2010, which was based on um, machine learning. They originally tried to program the Kinect with procedural um, code. You know, if the elbow does this, then it's this. And they found that uh, it was a dismal failure and went to machine learning to do that. Kaggle was also launched in 2010. It, uh, who here knows about Kaggle? Only two people. Kaggle is a data science competition which typically runs monthly, uh, founded by an Australian guy, and they offer serious cash, like $100,000, for people that can solve certain problems. So predicting cervical cancer in women based on certain inputs. So, you know, there's a whole massive community that are using these data science tools, which, which are in Python and R, to enter these contests. It's really interesting. Uh, 2011, uh, Watson came back and won Jeopardy. And then just uh, two years ago, AlphaGo won the um, Go game, which uh, is apparently really complex and took them a long time, you know, to move on from chess and checkers to win. So really long history. So what is machine learning? It's a really complex term. And at its heart, it is really simple. It's selecting a model, some model, which describes reality, and then working out the parameters to apply to that model. Really, really simple. So the simplest case of machine learning is a linear regression. You've probably all done this in high school, maybe many, many years ago. We've got this set of data points in blue, and we say, that looks like it's a linear relationship to me. So that's, I've done the first part of it, which is select a model. Here it's a, a linear relationship. And then I need to find the values, in this case for M and C, which minimise um, the, the square error. So that, that, that's the actual solution for it. It's got a very simple solution. You don't need a lot of computing power to solve that. But that's all machine learning is. So based on the data, I select a model and then I optimise my parameter set. Really, really, really simple stuff. Um, it gets complex in what is, what, what um, type of model do I select? And then as the model becomes more and more advanced, how do I um, find these parameters? You know, there's no closed form solution. So you need various numerical techniques. That's all machine learning is. It's really simple. Can be used for five key things. Classification. So this is an, um, a type of machine learning, which is typically an SVM, support vector machine. So it's dividing between two data sets. How do I div divide these two data sets in a sensible way? to work out which patients are crook and which ones are well, based on typically you know, something in their blood or something like that. Really simple. Regression uh, is another really, really common form of machine learning. It tip, what would the temperature be like tomorrow? So given a whole bunch of meteorological inputs, weather today and air pressure readings and cloud calculations, what's it going to do tomorrow in the weather? And they, they, they typically run a whole bunch of models um, and then take the average of that. Anomaly detection, another really common one, is this credit card transaction fraudulent. Here's a really simple example. Average uh, purchases per week and then the, um, plotted against the, uh, the total purchase. Um, Adam. Uh, I would love, I wonder if you could have anomaly detection when someone has trying to check in code that's so wildly different than like it's that yeah, absolutely, solved code yeah. has been 
proven to be um, uh, fragile. Yeah, so you'd need, what, what you need to do is somehow work out how to calculate those metrics. So you'd need a baseline, what looks like good code, and then you'd need, yeah, do you? Just accidentally, um, today I got email that there was a free license for MVPs or something like this, codealike.com. Mm -hmm. They've got plugins for development environments, like whatever, for Visual Studio yeah. in particular. And it just watches what you do, yeah. like how you code, and it can detect anomalies in your coding style. What was it? Codealike.com. Uh, basically, it would compare how you do and what's the optimal environment for you doing the coding, what distracts you from coding, uh, from doing the best. I just looked at it briefly, but it looks promising. It just looks at how you code, but I guess you can also compare it to others as well. And that would kind of give what Adam is after. Excellent. Yeah, cool. Codealike.com. Excellent, thanks George. And then the uh, fourth use is grouping of data. This is probably a, le a less common use, but this is a form of machine learning called unsupervised, where we don't know the answer ahead of time. So here we have tried to um, uh, group these states into four uh, groupings based on these two dimensions that make sense. Um, not that common, but it is used. And the final one is uh, recommender systems. I really like recommender systems because that's where crap can go wrong really rapidly. Anyone see this one? Walmart, heartsick over DVD grouping. You search for Planet of the Apes and it also uh, recommended you a bio on Martin Luther King. Obviously an intensely problematic use of recommender systems where, and also did, um, yeah, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory too. You ended up with Martin Luther King also being recorded. So obviously a very highly offensive outcome um, based on this. And no, no one's manually programming this, right? So you can end up with some crazy results. Did anyone see this um, Microsoft bot? Hold, hold on. Why did, why did it do such a weird grouping? Uh, I don't know. The, the tip, maybe people bought these together. Maybe it looked, uh, it depends what, what metrics they were looking at to group it, potentially um, doing image recognition on the people and you know, ended up like that. And I'll, I'll get another one, like Google got this wrong too, right? Um, I'll come to this later. Um, this is a Microsoft bot which was trained off Twitter um, to become sort of a, a, like a, you know, that paperclip thing, but it was like, you know, the, the clippy with attitude and it, end up, it ended up racist and homophobic and a Holocaust denier based on machine learning. So you could ask it, did the Holocaust happen? And it told you it was made up. So Microsoft had to pull this. Everyone's probably seen this one. Did someone blink in the photo? Again, this is AI gone horribly wrong. This is, this is me trying to offend everyone to keep you away. This, these are real world examples. Did it, this is uh, Google. Um, doing grouping, bottom center. Th these are real world examples um, of AI gone wrong. And I've also, I tried to find a, a redneck one, so to, to offend everyone. Um, there was an example where a father started getting um, uh, pregnancy stuff for his young daughter in the, in the mail. And he's going, what's this? Yeah, he, he rang up Target and was abusive and complaining. And based on, on her shopping patterns, that um, estimated she was in the second trimester of, of, of a teen pregnancy. And that was, um, it was actually accurate. They started sending her uh, cot type thing. So th that was the closest one I could find to offending um, redneck style people. Here's a, a funny one. Have that data. But we've also gone one step for further. In fact, it also tells the various teams in my organization and their close rates and what it be, you know, predicts will happen. Uh, so I can go ahead and in fact, because of Cortana, I can even integrate it with my voice commanding. So I can just go ahead and ask for it. Show me the, my most at-risk opportunities. 
No, that's not what I want. To buy milk at this opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> Let's try it again. <laughs> Show me my most at-risk opportunities. Oh, come on. Okay, starting from up. If this, one last try, let's try it. Show me my most at-risk opportunities. No, this is not going to work. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, but if I go back in here. <laughs> That's funny, hey. He's just blown it apart. Someone's trying to. Yeah, it, it wasn't even pre-canned type thing. Um, I found that one very, very funny. Like, I think we've all experienced those uh, uh, telephone voice recognition things that are way more complex than pushing two for accounts type thing. And again, the prototypical AI gone wrong, it's Arnie. Um, yeah, the Terminator. Um, actually, just in the news today, Russia is training a, a robot, um, a real world Terminator. There's real footage, I, I won't go into it um, at the moment. But, um, yeah, you can actually see a real-world Terminator they've got it in Russia. Fake news. Fake news. Is it? It was a fake. No, it's joking. No, it was <laughs> tweeted by the Russian deputy um, uh, uh, thing, Prime Minister. So here's our five uses. Classification, regression, anomaly detection, grouping, and recommender systems. They're the five prototypical uses. Why don't we all use it? Data collecting and cleansing is really hard. Again, really, really hard. Choosing an algorithm is hard. I'll show you a cheat sheet later on, but there's a, a massive array of algorithms and working out the appropriate one can be really challenging. Lots of training data is required. This can often be a killer. Typically, you'll want at least hundreds, if not thousands or millions of records to properly train a um, machine learning system. And that can be problematic in a lot of cases. Lots of computing power, not really a problem these days. We do run the risk of overfitting our model, which is where we perfectly fit our training data and we don't fit the real world data at all. So here's some examples. Here's an underfit model on the left where we, we've selected a linear regression, probably not appropriate. Here's something that looks pretty good where we've got this curve and here is where we've selected a crazy high order polynomial. We've matched every single sample in our training data but that obviously won't be representative in real world data. And the final problem is it's not a generalized form of intelligence. It only answers a very specific question. So why is it so popular? Really strong demand we, we, as a consulting company, we're seeing a lot of requests for machine learning in a hell of a lot of projects these days. Um, why? We've got a lot more data, we've got a lot more compute power and a lot more connectivity the real reasons why this is coming to the fore. So how do we do a uh, machine learning project? Again, very similar, define the business problem. There's no point predicting stuff <coughs> no one cares about. Identify, collect, cleanse the data. Again, very similar to the analytics phase. We then develop and deploy the model, which we'll go into in just a minute, and then monitor those results. So I'm gonna really quickly go through um, Azure Machine Learning. This is an awesome tool where you can get your uh, machine learning experiments and real world deployments up really quickly. If you've got the data, Azure ML Studio can give you a working production system in literally um, tens of minutes, hours and days. So how do we do this? Let's go in, this is my demo man. We input, collect, split, train the model oh, and I'll go through all this in um, Azure ML in a minute. This is, this is the real world Terminator that they've got in Russia. This is apparently real world footage of a Terminator shooting. So you can go and search it up, Russian Terminator. So here is ML Studio. I've logged in and I've got experiments here. Experiments is where we start. I've uh, cloned a, an existing experiment which is predicting, based on certain data characteristics, if you sailed on the Titanic, are you likely to live or die? This was a Kaggle competition run, I think, a few years ago. It's a really cool data set. Um, this is Azure Machine Learning. You can see it's very much like um, uh, SSIS or uh, BizTalk. Just a, a bunch of data flows. Adam? Yep, absolutely, yep. 
So the first thing is I have got my Titanic data set. It makes it really easy to visualize this. Very similar to what I was doing in Python. Here's all my, I've got 12 columns and I've got 891 passenger records, which were complete enough. I can go and see some, hist uh, some basic histograms of this. So here's the age of people sailing on the Titanic. The average age was about 30, and here's a distribution of their ages. This is whether they um, had a sibling or a spouse on board, parent or a child, their ticket type, the, the fare they paid, um, and the, where they embarked from, and their gender mostly males. So based on this, and this is what we want to predict, obviously, right? Whether they survived, zero, they died, or they survived. So this, this is the end outcome we want to get to. So I jump out of that. Here I'm doing my data cleansing and preparation. I select the columns which I'm interested in, do a bit of uh, metadata editing here. Again, some more metadata editing, and I clean the data. This is, I can see my cleaning mode here, I'm replacing them with the median. I can select a whole bunch of algorithms here to um, deal with missing data. This is the mice one I mentioned earlier, where you can do some really um, advanced projections based on your data. Again, some more cleaning, where I'm removing the entire row. That's, sorry, just having trouble scrolling. Repeating Adam's problems. It's wanting to scroll the whole window. There we go. Finally, what I do now is I split my data into a training set and a validation set. This is really typical um, in machine learning. Here I'm using 70% of my data to train the model, and I'm going to use 30% to score the model. This is a typical breakdown. You can also keep another. If you're going to rerun this a number of times, you might go 60, 20, 20. We 60% for training, 20% for validating that, and then a final 20% confirmation set. Here I've picked my algorithm. This is a two-class boosted decision tree. You can see here in machine learning, there is a massive... So these are the classes of problems I talked about. Anomaly, classification, clustering, and regression. Here I am doing a regression, trying to predict whether they survived or not. And you can see there is a very um, rich number of algorithms here that I can pick from. I'll show you a cheat sheet later on um, about which one to pick. Here I go in and train my model with that 70% of data. If I just put it here. This is scoring the model and finally the evaluation step. So I'm going here and see how my model went. One of the key uh, statistics here is the accuracy. This is um, basically the sum of my positives uh, divided by the sum of my total data. So you see here, I had 64 true positives and 18 false positives. This is my 30% validation set. And I had 34 false negatives and 151 true negatives. So just even based on that really simple data, we only had 12 columns. I could get 80% accuracy in predicting whether someone would survive the Titanic wreck. So that's pretty good. Um, if I'm happy with this model in Azure ML, I can then go in and translate that to a web service. Um, so there's another web service tab over here. Sorry, I've got it. Oh, gone backwards. We, we, we can deploy a web service here. So what that web service will let me do, I can either pass in a single row, which uh, represents um, typically something I had in my training set, right? So I'm passing those 12 parameters, and it will give me back a true false where that person survived, or there's also a batch interface. So if you've got the data, this makes it so easy, and you get charged per web service call is their charging model on this. It's awesome. If you've got the data, this will give you answers really, really, really quickly. It's a wonderful tool. Compared to the difficulty of setting up a model in um, MATLAB and having a virtual machine and needing 
you know, to spin up a web API and have firewalls and a batch interface, all that crap. So much work so. This is a great solution. You can go in here and experiment. I think this absolutely um, kicks butt as a machine learning um, option. Fair enough? Yeah, pretty good. So this is um, my predicted and I've got true and false and whether they were correct or incorrect. So that's how accuracy is calculated. There's a whole bunch of other figures that you can apply to your models um, and they'll give you an indication of what's going wrong with your models. So this is what it looks like. I had my model, this workflow, and I had my data. Really simple, really cool. This is the cheat sheet that um, Azure ML provide. So based on what you want to do, whether you want to do prediction, um, anom anomaly detection, discovering structure, and or predicting categories, you can pick these algorithms. You can see here they've got um, the various uh, benefits of each of these. The one we picked was the two class boosted decision tree because we wanted to categorize things um, into, uh, to, to divide things into two categories, whether they survived or not. Does that make sense? Yeah, really cool. This is a, another really cool resource. If you just search for this, Azure ML Cheat Sheet, you can find this. It's a huge head start for your ML experience. These are some great machine learning resources. We had Peter Myers here previously who did a, a very in-depth session on this as compared to you know, just a quick overview I did. If you really want to um, understand this, there's an awesome Coursera course which is um, Understanding Machine Learning from Scratch in MATLAB. It's about 10 weeks long. I've done it. Absolutely well worthwhile. You can pay 150 bucks at the end and you'll get a LinkedIn, um, you can uh, add it to your LinkedIn resume. They actually use machine learning in that. Um, when you're about to do an exam, um, they capture your typing signature and then at random points they'll ask you to type. Yeah, question down here, Adam. Just want to share as well that Microsoft has a professional certification program on data science. Yep. So if you open a web browser, it's on academy.microsoft.com. So it consists of uh, 10 different mo 10 modules, which uh, includes one uh, final project. Uh, the courses are hosted in edX. Um, you, I think now for each module, it costs about $99 to basically uh, obtain a uh, verified certificate, but otherwise you can you can do the courses uh, for free if you are, if you are not after the certificate. Excellent. Have, oh. you, have you done it? I've started, so I've completed two of the modules. So I'm I'm currently working on the third module. And, and what, what's the materials like? So the first module is basically just orientation on the whole program itself. The second module is on um, uh, T SQL. And they have so there are, there are other modules which is basically you get to choose whether you want to uh, take the Python or R, and for yeah so like for analyze and visualize data whether you want to choose you can you get to choose uh, whether you want to do Excel or Power BI yeah awesome uh, explore data with code you get to choose whether I want to take R or Python and yeah fantastic it's great yeah. Um, I really enjoyed the Coursera course um, I've got my two kids doing Coursera courses too. Coursera rocks, you can do like postgraduate level courses um, either for free or for a very minimal cost if you want a certification. Jess down the back has done two. She has done, give us a wave Jess. She's done international law and uh, entrepreneurship. And Alex, what did you do? Um, Python. Yeah, Alex did a 10-week course on Python programming. How old are you, Alex? 10. Yeah, so it's a really good thing. Um, if your kids are getting bored at school and you know, breaking people's arms because they're not properly uh, stimulated, Coursera is a good alternative to um, uh, riddle and or lobotomy. And Microsoft have a, um, an Azure virtual machine which has got a dedicated, um, all the tools you'll ever need for data science. Um, so there's a link to that. It's got um, Jupyter installed, so you can run your own instance of uh, Jupyter. It's got Python R, it's got everything. And that's uh, like all their virtual machines. It's just a pay per um, number of hours you've got it on. So you can just go and um, clone that virtual machine and use it to your heart's content without all the setup pain. Really, really cool. Microsoft are invest investing 
massively in this. So to summarize machine learning, really simple. All it is is parameter estimation for a model. Nothing really complex at all. Model selection and data preparation are hard, but it's becoming easier. So let's quickly wrap up what we did tonight. Did an introduction to data science. Well, what is a data scientist? We looked at their first, one of their primary tools, which is Azure Notebooks, and how you can explore data and then communicate those results to your stakeholders. We looked at what machine learning is, and then we uh, dove into Azure ML Studio to run a really simple uh, machine learning experiment. So with that, thank you, wrap up.